Yeah, good morning. Uh, I first would like to briefly acknowledge the contribution from my co-authors uh, Jens Kappenberg and Janina Sotman, who did the work on the Elbe estuary I'm going to present within this talk. Um, to briefly make you familiar with the region, uh, I'm going to talk about basically the North Sea, which is on the European continental shelf, and here specifically about the German North Sea coast in the southeastern part of the North Sea within the German Bight. Um, the German coastline is about 2,500 to 3,500 kilometers long, depending on how detailed you are looking at. About 50% of, of the German coast are below 5 meters above mean sea level, which means, uh, yeah, it is, and it is to a large extent one sea and sandy coast as illustrated in this figure. And this means that it is at risk from storm surges and rising mean sea levels and erosion. And this is briefly illustrated in this figure on the left. You see uh, in yellow uh, the area which is below the twice uh, daily uh, tidal high water and which is really already a substantial part. And in addition, you see in green, if you can uh, infer it here, the area which is below uh, the height that one of the major storm surges had uh, in February 1962. And this area accumulates to about 25% of the federal stage of Lower Saxony, which is here, and about 14% of the area uh, of Schleswig-Holstein, and about 14% of Lower Saxony, which is here. So this is really uh, some substantial area. And we are now looking at uh, the recent changes in extreme mean sea levels in Cuxhaven, which is located here just at the mouth of the River Elbe. And we have separated the time series into a part that represents uh, changes in mean sea level plus uh, tidal changes and changes related to uh, weather fluctuations, so the storm-related part. And what you do see is that the mean sea level uh, rise was about two millimeters per year within the last 100 years, which roughly corresponds to uh, the global average. Uh, and the um, storm-related or the weather-related fluctuations show some pronounced interannual and decadal variability, but no substantial long-term trend. So if you add up uh, those two time series, you see uh, that presently the, yeah, the, the trend is uh, basically related to changes in mean sea level and the tidal component. And the tidal component it is illustrated a little bit more detailed here. I took this figure from the PhD from Holle Branze in 2005, which shows the tidal range development at the Dutch and German coasts since about uh, 1880. And what you see is that the tidal range remained relatively constant until about 1950 or so, and then there was a substantial increase both for the Dutch stations but also for the German stations, and maybe there is some leveling off here after about 1990 or so. Uh, and there is uh, still discussion in the literature. There are different hypotheses, so it's not fully clear, clearly understood what happened here. So, uh, I'm now looking a little bit more detailed for, uh, to the case of Hamburg, which is down the estuary here. And thanks to my previous speaker, I don't have explained uh, a number of issues in um, very much detail because he very nicely set already the framework here. Uh, what you see here is uh, just the storm surges in Hamburg, San Pauli in the harbor since about 1750. Uh, the different colors give you the different uh, strengths of the events. And you additionally here see the, uh, the height of the coastal defenses illustrated by these horizontal green bars. And these little red stars uh, indicate dike failures, so failure of the coastal protection. And what you do see is that before 1850 or so, uh, coastal defense failure was a frequent phenomena. Uh, and then the dike height was raised, and then, uh, yeah, nothing severe happens until about nine, uh, until 1962, where a big storm uh, event hit Hamburg. We had massive failure of coastal defenses, about 300 casualties. Uh, it had, uh, about one sixth of the area of Hamburg was flooded. So this was really uh, a turn maker, 
and in result of that, coastal defenses were uh, heavily increased, and you see that after 1962, also the storm surge height reached levels that have never been observed before. And the reason for that, uh, as has already been illustrated by the previous speaker, is probably associated with changes that have been done in the estuary, mainly because of the deepening of the shipping channel and uh, changes in the coastal defense. And I'm going to illustrate this by the following two figures. This one shows you the change in tidal range in Hamburg St. Pauli. Uh, the top one is the annual mean high water and the lower one is the annual mean low water. And you see that around 1900 the tidal range in Hamburg was about two meters. It has increased to about three and a half meters nowadays. And you see a lot of these black uh, horizontal bars here and they all indicate different uh, water work measures different modifications to the coastal protection and so far that have been implemented. And what, of course, this is not a strict proof, but you see at least a timely coincidence between these water works and the changes in the tidal range. The effects of the water works could also be measured uh, by the differences in storm surge height and timing of the peak between the mouth of the river, uh, the estuary here in Cuxhaven, and Hamburg St. Pauli, and this is illustrated in these two graphs. The upper one shows you the difference in the storm surge levels between Cuxhaven and St. Pauli, and the lower one, uh, the difference uh, in the timing of the peak of the storm surge. And what you again can see is a relatively constant uh, levels here before 1962, then some change and maybe again some more or less stationary values towards the end of the period. So before 1962, we had a difference in storm surge peak heights of about 30 centimeters and a difference in timing of about four and a half hours. Nowadays, we have about 100 centimeter difference in the peak, uh, uh, in the storm surge peak and a difference in three of three hours. So when it comes to adaptation, um, then, um, yeah, one has to discuss the concept for the sustainable development of the tidal river Elbe that has been developed or put forward by the Hamburg Port Authority. And within this concept, there are basically two issues that uh, are outlined that could reduce storm surge peaks in Hamburg St. Pauli. And one of the ideas is that they suggest to uh, set back some of the topographic changes that have led to higher storm surges in Hamburg. And what you see here on the left is a typical sandbank in the River Elbe. And over the last decades here, substantial amounts of sands were eroded in the river mouse. And the idea is uh, to reduce the incoming tidal energy by feeding these sandbanks with coarse sandy material. And we have investigated on whether or not this works together with the Port Authority in an EU-funded project. And I don't have very much time to go into the details, but I just very briefly show some results here. So we set up a numerical model for the estuary, uh, a high resolution numerical model, and introduced some artificial sandbanks according to uh, the suggestions of the Port Authority. Uh, and um, to summarize, without going into the details, we found that only when very strong engineering measures are taken, we could reduce the high water levels or the maximum high water levels in Hamburg by about 10 centimeters, which is not really a strong effect, I would say. So the other measure suggested uh, by the Port Authority is that uh, we may support the present flood protection by providing additional storm surge polders again. And this is something we address now in an ongoing project uh, together again with the Hamburg Port Authority. So before I conclude, um, the, the situation was very special for the estuary. I would just uh, like to say something about the mainland, uh, which is very different, so where you cannot uh, apply those type of measures. Uh, and what could be done here was described, for example, in the revision of the master plan for coastal protection in Schleswig-Holstein in 2012. Uh, you have to know that the dike, uh, the, the um, coastline in Schleswig-Holstein is protected by an almost continuous dike line. Uh, and the Coastal Protection Authority says that adapting to the worst case scenario is probably not economically efficient, taking the huge uncertainties in climate change projections into account. 
So what they propose actually is a dike concept with inherent flexibility, and this is briefly illustrated here on the figure on the left. So what you see is in yellow, uh, the dike height as it is now before taking sea level rise into account. Uh, in the revision of the master plan, they accounted for uh, a 50 centimeter sea level rise, which uh, leads to these uh, light green dike profile. But additionally, they suggested to modify the dike profile according to the green one, so that later, if worst case scenarios could mater uh, materialize, so if the sea level rise would be much larger than 50 centimeters, they could add this red cap without paying too much extra money. So the idea here basically is that they develop some what they call no regret measures, which are also justifiable if the worst case scenarios do not materialize. And my very first slide is just to show that um, retreat for the German coast is probably hardly an option. Uh, and this, again, is a result we did jointly with authorities in Lower Saxony. And this figure uh, basically shows you again in, in green the area that is already nowadays protected by an almost continuous dike line. And then uh, we added here uh, a one, two, three, and even four meter sea level rise. And you see that the area that is additionally threatened is not very big. But again, uh, what you have to protect is already a very huge area with uh, many people living in with substantial values. So retreat is really something that you would not do immediately if it's not absolutely necessary. And for the time being, at the moment, it is still widely accepted that the dikes could be increased uh, without too much additional costs and that this is the way to go forward for this area. So to summarize, uh, what I try to say is that um, the Germ in Germany we try to develop flexible adaptation measures, measures. That means where possible we try to shift investments into the future and the, so that the decisions may be adapted to actual developments in the course of time, which is op uh, often called no regret measures. Uh, it is also important to develop robust adaptation measures so the strategy should work cost efficiently under all possible future developments or scenarios. Uh, it is, I think, important to avoid a single scenario strategy. And finally, uh, I didn't say anything about that. Uh, the intention is also to develop multi-purpose strategies because climate is only one aspect that requires adaptation. For example, in the Elbe estuary, there's also uh, a heavy discussion about the, um, uh, the, the sediment management and the, the developed strategies should actually uh, yeah, foster both. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ralf. Um, I think we have time for at least one quick question, if there are any. Yes, please. Um, actually, because uh, most of the, um, the sand was uh, above mean sea level, uh, and finally, the, the most effective one was to put yeah, the sand below sea level, but this has a heavy influence with the chipping channel, so we could not put the sand everywhere we like, so that's the problem. 